And now I would like to introduce Dave Sawyer, who is with FFW. He is a solutions architect by day and comedian by night. Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Good morning. My name is Dave Sawyer I'm with FFW. I just want to talk to you real quickly uh, so that I can uh, get back to the uh, Pantheon party, which is still going on right now. You know, for decades, technology has been inspired by science fiction. And we see many examples of this. One is uh, Martin Cooper, creator of the mobile phone, credits his inspiration to watching Captain Kirk on Star Trek talking on his handheld communicator. We see many examples of this over and over again, from Dick Tracy's two-way wristwatch radio to today's Apple Watch, from Hal to Siri. The impact of science fiction on real-world technology is undeniable. But what has been the impact of science fiction on Drupal? And is it a coincidence that Drupal 8 was released before the forthcoming Star Wars 8? Hmm. I've seen a lot of people at DrupalCon walking around in Star Wars shirts. Have you? That's what I thought. So, to get to the bottom of this, I recently interviewed several members of the Drupal community and I filed this report. This is Dave Sawyer from FFW, reporting from New Orleans. Is Drupal inspired by Star Wars? I conducted several interviews to find the truth. So you've worked in the Drupal space for many years, is that right? Yes, yes, quite some time. So you've probably heard about the connection between Drupal and Star Wars, right? Uh, what connection? Well, a lot of people are talking about how Drupal is inspired by the Star Wars storyline. You've heard that, right? Never heard that one. Mm. Mm. He was obviously hiding something. I could tell I was onto something big. So, Ryan, you're a Drupal developer. I mean, haven't you heard rumors that there's a connection between Drupal and Star Wars? Star Wars? No, I don't think so. You know, I've been a host of the Drupal Easy podcast for eight or nine years now. I've been a Drupal user for a while. We've interviewed Dries on our podcast, and I've never heard of such a thing. Be honest with me, though. Are you hiding something? No, I don't know what you're talking about. So you're a Drupal consultant, is that right? Yeah, I spend a lot of time with clients talking about Drupal, what a great solution it is. They're always amazed that such a powerful tool doesn't have any licensing cost and that they can just use the source. I'm sorry, did you just say use the force? <laughs> no, I said use the source. You know, like the source code? Hmm. It seemed he was giving me some sort of a clue. I knew I was close, so I asked him again. Is there a connection between Drupal and Star Wars? I'm sorry, I, I really need to get back to work. Please join me in welcoming to the stage your keynote speaker. You may know him as Schnitzel, Group CTO at Amazie, Michael Schmid. Thank you. Good morning. So, your brain health is more important than your standing desk. That's what I wrote. A couple of weeks ago, when I entered my community keynote on the events page on Drupal.org. So what do I mean with that? It's going to be a story about me. It's going to be a story about how I started what I'm currently doing. So that's me. A couple of years ago in the Swiss military. I'm Swiss. 
And in Switzerland, we still have a mandatory military service. So every man goes for at least 21 weeks to the military. And you would probably guess that we are like out in the woods every day doing, preparing ourselves for war and learning how to survive and all these things. And I'm really sorry it's not that. Um, I was in the Air Force and we spent a lot of time in offices. We spent a lot of time preparing exercises and organizing things and doing stuff. But there were some occasions where we went out. And one of them was a three-day exercise where we knew we have to rob through forest and learn how to build tents and all these things. And I was, I was really excited because, you know, sometimes you just want to go out and, and learn new things that you don't know. So the exercise started, and the first night we found a farm. And there was a farmer, and he was super happy to have us there, and we slept there. We slept with the cows in the same room, and um, it was all good. And on the next day, we continued, so we got, we got the order to actually sleep outside. So we found a place in a forest. We put our tents up and organized everything. And then we got the order that we need to have a guard. We needed to guard it, our small little village that we set up in that forest. And it wasn't a big deal that we did that all the time, just that I got the shift from 2 to 3 a.m. in the morning. So didn't make a big deal out of it. We planned the next day, and we said, OK, we get up at 7 o'clock in the morning. So I was planning myself, OK, if I go to midnight, then I can sleep for two hours, then I do the guard, and then I can sleep another. So I was perfectly fine with that situation to get up middle of the night, protect my fellow older soldiers, and do that. So we had dinner, and I went to bed. I got up at 2 o'clock in the morning again. It wasn't easy, but I did my duty. And when I went to bed, I realized, when I went back into my tent, I realized it slightly starts to rain. But I wasn't too much worried about that. Um, so I went to bed, fell asleep again. And then during the night, I'm hearing screams, screams of BG4, BG4. It's German, it means Bereitschaftsgrad 4, which basically means you have to get in a full-on chemical and bio biohazard suit with gas mask, gloves, another suit. It's super hot in there. It's not, definitely not what you want to do. So I'm lying in my sleeping bag under my tent, and I'm hearing that BG4, BG4, and it wakes me up. And I'm lying there, and it's really like, like what's, what's, what's happening? My, I wasn't prepared at all for that. And so I'm trying to reach my, my watch. And while I'm turning, I'm also realizing I'm completely soaking wet. My whole sleeping bag got socked up because my tent has a leak that I didn't realize. It started to rain like crazy. And I was completely soaking wet lying in the bed, and I really didn't know what to do anymore. I knew I have to get up. I have to get into that suit, because there's no other way. But I didn't want to. I just I, I didn't know what to do. So I, I was wondering, where is the shut-off switch? There has to be one. And I closed my eyes, but I couldn't, I couldn't find it. I, there, there was nothing. So there was no escape at that situation. There wasn't also, in the Air Force, we had cool helicopters that sometimes rescue you. But I'm listening. I was listening to a helicopter sound, and there was none. There was also no waking up, because I just woke up. So I'm lying there, completely soaking wet, not knowing what to do. I, it was probably one of the few times in my life that I really didn't know. And I was hopeless. I was thinking that's like the worst situation. It was actually an exercise. It wasn't something I knew. It's not something really bad. But I just you know, was in that situation that I did not know what to do anymore. 
So I was lying in there thinking, what can I do? And a couple of minutes or seconds, I don't know, while all these screams around and people are like already starting to remove my tent because everybody knew we have to leave now, I realized that everything will be good again. It's just an exercise. It's not something that is going to go kill you. It's not something that is going to take forever. It's going to be over at one point, and it will be good again. I did not know when exactly. I did not know how exactly, but I knew it will be the case. And that gave me hope. So I got up, got into the suit, helped others, and I realized also others were at the same situation. They were not prepared for that. And actually, the, the hardest part for me was that I didn't get enough sleep. I was like, I was really angry at everybody that I didn't get enough sleep. I only had like three hours of it. So I realized, sorry, I realized we are survivors. As humankind, we survived so many situations in life, and we are, we have that in our core to survive a lot of crazy things. But I also realized I need to prepare myself better. I need to prepare my, if I just knew, if I didn't think that I get six or seven hours, I wouldn't have been so angry at myself or angry at the others that I only got three hours of sleep. So I really learned that I need to prepare myself. The problem though, work, as we do it all together, wherever, in which company, as freelance or whatever, it's not an exercise. It's our real life. We don't know sometimes when it's going to be over. So I'm not a doctor. And I just have a lot of experience in working in tech. I work at Amazi for seven years now. And right now we have five companies. And we have a new one in the making. We have offices at three different continents with more than 40 people and definitely no plans to stop any of that. But I can tell you, sometimes it's not easy. Sometimes I'm back, hopeless, not knowing what to do in situations like if you, when you have to fire people or when you have hard decisions to make, when you have clients calling you that are angry and you don't know anymore what to do. And a lot of times I'm feeling back in that situation. I remember that I just need to prepare myself and it's gonna be good. So if we look at elite sports, they do a lot with their bodies. But if you look at tech, they, we do a lot of things with our brains. Our brain is our elite sports. And they, they treat their bodies really, really well. They make sure that their body's happy. They make sure that their muscles are happy, that their muscles are prepared, that everything they, they need to do at one point is prepared. So I really believe <laughs> So I really believe our brain needs treatment as well. Our brain needs the same treatment like elite sports are treating their body. Our brain needs treatment as well. So that's why I'm saying our brain health is more important than your standing desk. So I want to give you some examples of things that I learned over the past seven years that I do to keep my own brain healthy. The first one is get a coach. And I'm not specifically talking about the coach that you maybe pay for. That can be, that's what I do, but 
that you need somebody that allows you to follow your goals, to keep track of your goals. Somebody that you go on a regular basis that just asks you, how are you standing? Where are you with your goals? What is the current situation? Did you achieve it yet? Did you not? If I look over the last seven years, I overestimated so much what I can do per day. And I think everybody of us that ever estimated what they want to achieve in a day knows that. I think our brain is playing tricks on us if we just ask ourselves, what can we do per day? But I can definitely tell we are hardly underestimating what we can do in a full year. Myself, a year ago, I decided I want to hand over the CTO of Amazi Lab Zurich to my co or my deputy CTO at that time, Josef. And I wanted to have a second apartment in Austin, and that involved like getting rid of my own apartment in Zurich, going moving to a smaller one, selling all my stuff, and doing a lot of things. And I went to my coach and he asked me, What do you want to do in a year? And I just told him without thinking if I can achieve it or not. For me at that time, it was completely unachievable. So the only thing we did, just every month, we were sitting together, and he, the only thing he did, he reminded me of my goals. And I saw my goals in front of me, and I knew I want to do this. So we did step by step. I completely implemented a new management structure of the tech team in Zurich. We sent people to leadership schools. I did coaching to my deputy CTO. I started to sell my apartment. I found a new apartment in Austin. I sold all my stuff. And I achieved it in a year. And if, you, if I would go back and ask myself a year ago, I would not have believed that I can do that. And the coach didn't tell me how to do it. It was all myself. The only thing he did, he asked me, where are you right now? And that can be a group that can be your boyfriend, that can be your girlfriend, that can be anybody. Just somebody that you go and you have to show your own process. Number two, reflect. So the coach allows you to think about in a monthly base. But a lot of times, we think also in weeks. So what I do, I reflect myself once a week. Once a week, I ask myself if the last week that I just has passed, am I still happy if the same week is going to happen again? And to be honest, a lot of time I say no. A lot of time I say no, I want to change some things. I want to try something new. But just thinking about that, just realizing that you want to change something, already helps you a lot. So I do that every week. I ask myself, am I still happy if the last week that happened is going to happen again? And for me, that is the core question. I'm not asking myself, how many hours do I work? Like, upcoming to that DrupalCon, especially starting a new company, I was working roughly 80 to 100 hours per week. And I asked myself every week that question. I said every time, yes, I'm still happy. So for me, it's not about how many hours sleep, how many hours of work. For me, it's really myself. I go into myself and I ask myself, is the situation you're in, are you still OK with that? And if not, then change something. And I try to change a lot of things. The week later, I ask myself again and again and again. So try to get into a rhythm that you reflect yourself on the week before. The next one took me quite a long time to realize that. I was just working every day. I liked to get up really late. And I literally walked like at 8.58. I walked into the office and attended stand-up. And then in the evening, I was working more. And, and I never really had a productive time. And then I started to work earlier in the morning. And I realized that working for myself Working in the morning allows me to really focus for a couple of hours on a something without any distraction. 
we are in a team world. We work in a team, especially in tech, with as a person itself cannot achieve something. But I know, and I felt myself, that sometimes it's just necessary that you have two hours where there's no Slack, where there's no Twitter, or nothing else. And at the beginning, what I tried is just to disable these tools. But that didn't work at all, because I knew the people are on. I knew I could some miss something. So I ended up in just checking every 15 minutes, like just in a Slack channel. Then I got distracted, and I was somewhere else. So what I do now, I get up really early. It's not easy, but it allows me to have my two hours productive time every morning that I can really focus. And that helps me a lot in getting things done, especially as we hear later, that I maybe dislike. So number four, splitting up your day. Everybody of us has things you have to do that you don't like at all. Myself, for example, time tracking. I'm really, really bad in it. So I realize, every now and then I realize, look, the last two days, you just completely forgot it. And then in the past, I told myself, yes, I'm going to do it. I'm going to do it at one, at tomorrow I'm going to do it. And then three days later, I realize, now you have to do whole five days. So what I do is I try to split up my day, and I try to split it up in a way that I first do things that I completely dislike. I start my day with something I completely dislike. And it's hard. It's not easy. But it allows me to get these things done. And I do them time boxed. So I'm setting an alarm for 30 minutes. And I do things that I completely dislike. And I do them for 30 minutes. And then I do something that I like. And I, grad, and I give that to myself for a bit longer time. But again, it is time box. So for a more hour, I do something that I like. And a lot of times, I didn't finish what I dislike for the 30 minutes, so I just go again. So I do it again. I do something again that I dislike. And then again, I do something that I like. And that just goes on. And at one point, you will have done your, all your dislike stuff, and then you can do everything you like. But that helps me when I realize I really have to do something. So you can see me in the morning, getting up, going to the office, and the first thing I'm doing, I'm trying to figure out which hours I worked in the last three days. But then I've done it. Then I'm over, and then I can really can focus on my day with stuff that I completely like. And so I'm just repeating through that. And it's getting something that, that you're really getting used to. And you just do the stuff you dislike, and you have to do them. The next one is about our body again. And you maybe heard before that 60% of our body is water. I think we all learned that at one point in biology class. Somebody told us that. And it's like, OK, yeah, I mean. I cannot see it, but makes roughly sense. But did you know that our brain consists of 85% water? And that was really surprising for me, because I thought it's the same. It's actually more than our whole body. So it looks like our brain is really thirsty. And there's a lot of things about how much water you should drink. And if you Google right now, you will find a lot of different things. It's not really clear what. And as I said, I'm not a doctor. That's what I found a lot of times that makes for me most sense, that it's based on your body weight. So on your body weight, if you are in the imperial system, it's half an ounce or two an ounce per pound. Or if you are metric, um, it's 60 to, uh, 30 to 60 milliliter per kilogram. For myself, that's between 2 and 4 liters. That's a big range. And the idea behind it, it really depends on your own body. It depends on how much you exercise. It depends on what the outside temperature is. It depends on where, on which place in the world you live, on the amount of water you need. But definitely, you should drink more than the minimum. You should stay above that. Why should we do that? So science shows that if you are only 1% dehydrated, you can already measure 
a 5% decrease in cognitive functions. It's only one single percent less water in your body than there should. And that's not a lot. And even worse is, if you have a 2% dehydration, your short-term memory is getting fuzzy. And for me, especially in programming, when you're like working and writing code, you have to remember that what you just wrote before. And if that's getting fuzzy, I mean, how can you write code if you don't remember what you just did? And you also have problems focusing on tasks. And that's, again, only with 2% dehydration. So it's really important that we drink enough water throughout our day. And there's a lot of different ways of doing that. One thing that I tried, I had a Slack bot that reminded myself, drink water. And after some times, you just get used to it. So right now, I don't have to, I don't need external information anymore. I just drink the water that I like. And right now, I'm between three or four liters per day. And it's also important I'm talking about water. I'm not talking about Red Bull. I'm not talking about Coke. I'm also not talking about Diet Coke or Coke Zero. I used to drink seven to eight bottles of Red Bull per day. And I can tell you when I stop and switch to water, my whole body was like, it, it was so much better. I lost, first I lost weight without and doing anything because I put so much sugar into my body. I exercised a lot. That was my excuse all the time. I said like, oh, I'm exercising three days per week. And that probably helped. But I realized how my body was just happy that I gave him not sugary water, that I just gave him water only. So I, I cannot even remember when I drank my last Red Bull, but sorry, Red Bull. So <laughs> yeah, slides.com, sorry. OK, next one, taking breaks. And one other thing that I, 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 I learned it myself, and then I researched it, and I realized that, and research again shows that our brain is in two different modes. Our brain can be in two different working modes. One of them we probably all know is the focus mode. It's where we're really into where we, everything around us is completely gone. And we are either focusing on whatever you do, reading, coding, giving it a session, or whatever it is. So that's a completely focused mode. But there's another mode that we probably all, all know. It's called the diffuse mode. And the diffuse mode is like the daydreaming mode. It's like when you're just there and not specifically thinking about one thing. So one interesting thing is that we, if you have a really hard problem, we cannot solve really hard problems in the focus mode. Our brain needs the diffuse mode where you are open to ideas to solve really hard problems. And I can definitely find that that a lot of times I'm just working on something and I cannot figure it out and I'm stuck and I don't know how to solve a problem. But I'm trying to fix it and I'm researching, I'm Googling or whatever and I, I just don't, do not find an, a solution. Then I get up and I walk three steps and after these three steps I have, I see a solution in front of me. So just getting up, moving the body, seeing other things. Also, your body has to focus that he's not walking into that door that you just walk through. Like just all these things that your brain suddenly has to do other things allows you to also think different. So how do we make breaks? How do we make breaks if we have a lot of stuff, have, have a lot of work every day? And I tried, I tried all these different tools. If you go in Google, like, take break tools or whatever, you will see that there are thousands of tools that either shut, completely lock your computer or tell you all the time that you should do it now. I tried a lot of them. And for me, they only worked exactly once till I deinstalled them. Because I hate taking breaks. I want to I wanna finish. I'm in, in my focus zone. I'm really there, and I want to do them. And I know I should take breaks. But if you are in that situation, you don't want to do that. 
So I found a way, and again, it has to do with our body. If you drink a lot, <laughs> you also have to pee a lot. And for me, it's something that I cannot not do. <laughs> it really forces myself in taking breaks. And it's so surprising every time. Every time I'm like in my zone, I'm working and I'm realizing my body tells me, hey, you should pee now. And then I'm like, no, no, I can do it. And then you're trying to fix a problem, you try to fix a problem, and then you end up in a problem, and I say, okay, I get up. And then you walk, and again, three steps later, you realize something about a problem or whatever. So the combination of these two, and now probably all my coworkers in Zurich why do, know now why do I get up so, so often? Because it's probably way, definitely more, but it helps me in ta forcing myself in taking breaks, forcing myself to get away from the computer, get away from the problem, think about the whole picture. Sometimes, though, you are really stressed. And I had situations myself that you are stressed and you, wanna, you, wanna, you need something that relaxes you in a short amount of time. And I tried a lot of different things, and at the end, I really believe it doesn't matter what exactly you do. So you can do sports, you can go work out, you can listen to a podcast, you play a little game on your computer, you read, you watch TV. Just find something that you really like, that relaxes you, that you can do when you know there will be a test, there will be whatever. Something that calms you down. So it can really be whatever you want. What I just believe, it should be something that it doesn't take too long, because if you end up taking whatever, doing a three-hour workout, you're going to miss whatever you just did for that workout. So um, it should be something that is just gives, allows you to go back in your comfort zone, that gives you a short amount of time that it relaxes you. So for me, sometimes, it's just spending time with kids. I have a lot of friends that have kids, and I, I just go out with them, and I get my fingernails painted. And it's just, it, it allows me to go away from the daily stuff. And maybe it's just 15 minutes, but it allows me to go somewhere else, to go in another place, and then go back. A lot of time, though, the kids maybe are not around, so I'm just showering. So I, sh I shower every morning religiously. Showering helps me in f structuring my day and also relaxing. Because when I get up, I see already my phone or I already know what I have to do. So showering in the morning just gives me a short amount of time to relax. And sometimes I even shower just in f before I do something. So when I go to a test or when I do something specific and I know I'm stressed because of that, I just take a 10, 15 minute shower that allows me to completely relax, to think about again, remind myself that it's going to be over, that I just have to repair myself. The obvious one is about sleep. And I read a lot about how much we humans should sleep. Interesting is we don't yet really know why we need sleep. So for for me, it's also really hard to stay on stage and say, okay, you should sleep that amount of hours. I think it's really something that you should figure out yourself. There are, I met a lot of different people that have a lot of different sleep ways. I also myself tried a lot of different sleeping patterns. So I tried for myself to sleep twice per day instead of only one. Um, so I tried a lot of things. And I really encourage you to know yourself how much sleep you need. But one thing that is really astonishing for myself is you remember that daylight saving that we do twice a year? On the next day, there's a 17% increase in car accidents. So for me, and I can definitely say my brain is confused during daylight saving. So if you sleep less than you should, that there is, there is danger involved in that. Because every daylight saving day, on the next day, we have 17% increase. 
So for myself, I right now know I can roughly sleep six hours per night, and then I need, after seven days, I need probably eight or nine hours. So I can do that cycle. But again, figure out yourself how much it is. There is one other cool thing, though. A lot of time, I cannot fall asleep. And so I learned one thing first. Go to bed only when you're really tired. Don't go to bed when you think, now I should sleep. If your body doesn't show you that you're tired, for me at least, it never works. I cannot really force myself to go to bed. But sometimes you're even tired and you cannot fall asleep. So I try to find tools or hacks, as we heard before, to get myself sleeping. So one of the things I do is called relaxing breath. And there is a, a pattern behind it. It's a four, seven, eight pattern. So what does it mean? You breathe in for four counts through your nose. You hold your breath for seven counts. And then in eight counts, you breathe out through your mouth. And interestingly, it doesn't really matter if that is seconds or whatever. The difference between the breathing in and the breathing out, so the breathing out is double as long as the breathing in, that's the important part. And I do that every time when I go to bed and I'm realizing my pulse, or my heart is pumping, because I'm already thinking about the next day or, I, or what just happened today, so I need to relax myself. And what I do, I'm lying in bed, and I'm trying to listen or to feel my own pulse. And when I first read that, I didn't believe it's possible, but it is. If you're just lying in bed and trying to listen to your own body, you can, you can feel your, your pulse pumping. So what I use, I use the pulses as counts. And that also tells me when I'm relaxing. So when I do it the first time, already when I breathe out the first time, during breathing out, I can feel how my pulse is slowing down. So it allows me to relax my body and with that, better fall asleep. There are even people that say they fall asleep during that. Never happened to me, but because it's actually, it's, it's kind of hard to do that because you really had to hold your breath. It's not something you do out of, out, um, in a regular um, day. So, for me, I only do it two or three times, and it already helps me to relax. But still doesn't mean I'm sleeping. So there's another trick. And as we are a PHP conference, you can show the trick in code. So I'm counting down from 100. And I can tell you, I never ever in the last four years reached zero in my life. So how does it work? You just start at 100, and you count down. And you maybe believe now that's completely bullshit. And I, when I heard that the first time, because we all know the sheep counting, you know, like just one sheep, two sheep, two sheep. What is interesting, though, the counting down is something we don't do regularly in our daily lives. So it is something that our brain has to slightly give focus to. And it allows your brain to distract itself from all the other things that you're thinking about. And interestingly, sometimes I start to count up suddenly again. Like I'm maybe at 70, and then 69, 68, 69, 70, 71, and then I realize, oh, no, no, it's the wrong way, and then I go back. But it really allows me to focus on something that is slightly hard, not too hard, than the hard, like the hard problems I'm trying to solve. And the lowest number I can remember is seven. I was really scared there, but, but I fell asleep at roughly seven. And interestingly, now I do that for more than three years. And it's a tool now that my body somehow learned, if I do that, you have to fall asleep now. So I had a really hard time in the past falling asleep in an airplane. Maybe that's because I sleep on my, on my stomach all the time, or maybe I really like planes. Maybe it's both, I don't know. But I had a really hard time falling asleep. And that thing now, if I just sit in a seat in an airplane or actually anywhere, and I start to counting down, I gonna fall asleep. I'm not doing it now because there's more stuff here coming go. But, um, 
it really helps me. It's a tool for myself that somehow my body learned, if I do that, now please go to bed or please fall asleep. So it helps me falling asleep faster than when I actually, when I'm in a stressful situation, I know I have to get up in the morning again. And that's most of the time more stressful, so you cannot really go to bed. So that really helps me. One other thing, and that's obvious, I guess, but one thing that I had to painfully learn myself is to turn off all distractions. Set your phones in a way that um, they're not vibrating, that they're not making any sounds. Except maybe you have a hosting company and you're on duty, then don't turn it off. But um, there are, I hardly believe that there's something that has to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning. So turn them off. I told myself in the past, no, no, it's just good. I'm ah, setting that up is not necessary. But I can tell you, if you do that, you will sleep better. And sleeping is very important. So sometimes all these tricks, they, they work for myself. But there are situations where it doesn't work anymore where you're so stressed, where you're just in a hole, where you're stuck, that you cannot get out anymore. And so what do we do? In regular life, let's say you have bad eyes. You realize your eyes' vision is strange. So what do we do? We go to a doctor, and the doctor helps us. If you have a broken arm, we go to the doctor. And he helps us. If we are sick for a longer amount of time, we go to the doctor too. It's exactly the same. So there was a study by osmihelp.org, that is the open source mental health initiative. And they asked people, do you think that discussing a physical health, like eyes, broken arms, or you're just sick, would have negative consequences to your job? 77% said no. 19% said maybe. And 4% said yes, it could have negative consequences. So that means they would not do that. Interesting, though, and probably not surprising for you, is our brain can also get sick. It's a part of our body that can get the same problems like a broken arm or things, st stuff that does not work anymore correctly in our brain. But if we ask the same question about mental health, so do you think that discussing a mental health issue would have negative consequences? The result is different. Now only 36% say no, 41% say maybe, and 23% say yes. yes it will have negative consequences, and therefore I'm not talking about that with my peers, with my friends, with my family, and or with my boss. And I really think that's completely wrong. If we as a society treat people that have brain-related issues and they cannot talk about that, we do not allow these people to actually get treatment. Because they, these people, they will not go to doctor because they're afraid that it will come out. How do I tell my boss that I have to leave in the afternoon? Do I make something up or so? So it's really, really important that we learn to talk about mental health like it is any other physical health in our body. So I. So I really encourage you, if you feel to be in such situation, there is treatment out there. Go to your doctor like you would go to your doctor like any other physical health issue. There is treatment. There are solutions. Please do that. And if somebody gives you shit about that, don't care. Please don't care. It's about you. It's about your body. It's about your brain. It's about your own life. So please do that. So all of that 
they're all really cool things, and you can do them, and they get better. So over the last seven years, I started to doing that, and I learned one important thing. I learned that I have to prepare myself, that I have to prepare myself for anything that is coming up, for anything that maybe is going to be really hard. So I do that every day. So as some of you know, I ran for the Drupal Association board. And for me, that's quite a big thing. Because at first, it's the second time. And then it involves a lot of things. It involves going to a camp. It involves going to run, your, show yourself like what, what are your, you go to um, these meet the candidate sessions. So it's a big thing. And I know when it will come out, I will be alone. I will be at a conference, most probably in a hotel room myself. So I knew that. I checked the times when this is going to happen. So I prepared myself. And I prepared myself in, OK, there can be two different situations. The first of them is, I'm the winner. That was the easy part. So I just said, well, I'm happy. I'm going to maybe tweet about it, whatever. That was the easy part. But there was the other part of, it's maybe not me. So I prepared myself with saying, OK, I'm going to tweet to the winner. I'm showing. Um, to the world that I'm happy for that person. And that was like my, I knew there will be steam in me. And I knew I want to get it out. And I wanted to get it out via Twitter to my, all my peers. Because I know friends of me, uh, friends of mine will be there and will read it. And if they see that I'm happy for the winner, that felt myself. So the day came. It was Tuesday evening, I guess. And I got an email. I got an email that said something about Drupal Association board members. And I can feel my pulse jumping from 60 to probably 180. And I'm reading through the mail, and I'm completely hopeless again. The problem was the mail only told me that I'm not the winner. The mail did not tell me who the winner is, and therefore, I could not do my preparation. And I do not want to blame the mail. The mail was good intention. It was good intention to telling everybody that runs that was desperately waiting on the going out. It wanted to tell everybody, we're really sorry it's not you. We're going to announce tomorrow who it is. So it has nothing to do with the mail that I felt hopeless. I just was not prepared for that. So I had to get out steam. And I don't know, Holly, if you're here. If you're here, I'm very sorry for the mail that I wrote you. <laughs> but it had to get out. It had to get out of me. And I felt better right after writing the mail. I don't feel good now about it. But I just was not prepared for it. So all these things, all these things I told you, they will not fix everything. You will fail. And you will fail very, very hard. You can try to prepare. And it makes things easier. But it's not a fix for your whole life. And I learn that every, every day. So you will never be perfect. And that is perfectly fine. Because I don't believe there is a person out there in the world that would say of itself, I'm perfect. We maybe believe that all these people are saying that. But if you actually ask them, if you would ask me, I'm not perfect. The only thing, though, I can do is I can learn. I can learn from, my pr from things that happen, and I can improve them. And that's the only thing that really keeps me going that every time I realize something or something happens that I did not expect, I'm trying to reflect about what happened. And I'm trying to improve it for the time that is coming. So these are all things that you heard today. You don't have to apply any of that. You can apply all of that. Pick out what you think you want to try. Talk to me about them. Tell me if they work. As said, I'm not a doctor. I did not study any of these things. 
I just do them since seven years, and I can tell you, for me, they all work. And I think it's really important that we also start to discuss among us about what works for us, that we are not just sharing the newest, coolest tech tools, that we also share really cool hacks for ourselves. Start the discussion about our brain, our bodies, and that will make us as a community much better and will help people that are in hard situations to open themselves to learn about it and get better. Thank you. Yeah, okay, okay. I'll sit with the king again. <laughs> Seems to be the theme. Uh, so thank you so much. That was uh, amazing. Uh, so many interesting and amazing and insightful points about uh, uh, overall health and, and in the technology uh, sector that we work in. Um, two key points that I, I'm taking away from, from everything I saw there were um, um, awareness and making decisions. Mm -hmm. So having the awareness of what is happening with your health and then making decisions based on that. And I'm guilty of this. You, you are, according to what you were saying, and I think everyone else is too, just uh, having the ability to have the awareness and maybe having some tools to give you that awareness and uh, making decisions on that. Um, um, do you have any recommendations? I mean, as developers, I think we, we immediately go to what tool can we use to help us to become aware of what's happening. Maybe there are some automated tools or, or other, other ideas like that. I think it's really having people around you that somehow force you to talk about that. Like, if you had a hard day, like in work, either talk on IRC. It doesn't matter. The tool really doesn't matter, but just talk about it. Because a lot of time, that forces you to explain to somebody else what exactly happened. And for me, especially in coaching sessions, a lot of time I go there and I have an unsolvable problem for myself. And then I explain somebody that was not in that situation. I explain that to somebody else. And while explaining, I'm realizing that I already have the solution. But just forcing myself to go through the steps, what exactly happened, what, what is the situation, allows me to have also an overview picture of something. So, um, and I think that was something that I learned also, like the reflecting. I didn't do that before I started the coaching. So during the coaching, I realized that I have to reflect myself. So I, I put myself into that situation. So I think it's really a process that you have to start with getting comfortable also in, in thinking about these things. Uh, so in, in the realm of, of coaching and um, uh, finding those resources to, to help us make those decisions, and, and uh, well, with the awareness first and then making those decisions based on that, um, helping us through, um, looking to examples within our own uh, communities and, and so on. Um, in Toronto, we had our recent Drupal camp, and instead of having a keynote to start it, we um, arranged a panel of, of uh, longtime members to talk about the history of the group and, and all sorts of things. But one element that came up was the idea of burnout, and I talked about that with Dries in the, in the keynote. And one of our members, uh, who actually founded our group, was at the first DrupalCon, et cetera, hit a real hard wall with burnout, and, and being able to, essentially, he encapsulated it with saying no, learning how to say no. And maybe that is an element of, of what you discussed, too, is um, being comfortable with saying no and how to learn how to do that. Do you have any uh, commentary or in ins insights in what could lead to that process and being able to do that? Yeah, I think it's a lot about the saying no, especially in open source. It's, the, the community is awesome, and we really try to help each other. But I think, um, yeah, the ability to say no and for me, actually, I realized it's not about the yes or no. For me, it's the yes, but later. That helps me a lot, because I don't want, if somebody comes to me and has a question, and I see that that person 
is struggling and I have, I have the solution. Like while the person tells me what it is about, I know I can help that person. But it's not about, I don't have time right now. It's that problem. And sometimes a problem that somebody brings you and talks to you right now feels more important than the problem you're trying to fix that is, may, that is actually maybe more important. So a lot about the saying yes, but please later, or yes, let's, med let's set up a meeting tomorrow, or let's set up a meeting in an hour, so I can go back to my problem. That helps me a lot in being in the situation of wanting to help, but not having time. Because I don't want to just say no. That's because I especially, like, I, I can help the person <laughs> that says. Um, yeah, so yeah. Um saying no or, or yes but later is a um, um, uh, great idea. Sometimes we're under deadlines and it's really hard to, um, a deadline is a deadline is a deadline. We, we can't do anything about it and we just have to get into that state of mind where we know, as you said right at the top of the keynote, um, you know you'll get into this situation where you're overwhelmed with work and stress and things and there will be light at the end of the tunnel and how to get to that. Um, preparing yourself and, and um, the, the mindset of being able to do that is very difficult. And yes. uh, there are, are companies who have programs in place to help their staff, uh, employees, remote workers, et cetera, be able to deal with that. Um, do you have any um, additional thoughts on how that can work and, and how companies can bring that kind of culture to their, to their company? Yes, so what we try is we have scrum teams and the scrum teams do the retrospectives. And it's really the part where it's important to talk about also feelings or how we felt in specific situations. And I think that allows, again, an open discussion, not about just that we used the wrong tool or we used the wrong process. It's also about how can we make ourselves better. And it's definitely a process to get that in. I think also, um, especially maybe in tech, that's the view I have. We are not used to talk about our feelings, but especially in a team, of like four and five people that together achieve a goal, it's really important that we know what also the status is. And so like if somebody has, let's say, um, a really hard time in their personal life and because of that can maybe deliver less in a team or can maybe, or it's just in their thoughts a lot of other ways, it's important that the whole team knows so that we talk about that. And that's definitely something at least we try to, to encourage to tell everybody, hey, if you are in a specific situation, we need to know that and let's talk about it. And especially if you want to get that um, allowed to do that in a company, I think the easiest way is to step up and start with yourself as the management, as the, t as the team lead or as the scrum master, whatever it is. If you want to change something, if you show that you want to change with doing it yourself, everybody else will follow. And I can definitely say it makes it much better of a team if the team can talk about also personal issues, stressful situations, and stuff like that. Great. Um, I think, uh, so you put up seven years on the slide, and many of us have worked in the technology industry for a long time. Um, I've personally seen this trend towards this idea and this way of thinking, and, and I can see it only improving and become more, becoming more uh, wider spread throughout the industry. Um, do you have any thoughts on what the future of this, this kind of um, attention to our, our health can, can be? Cool, good question. I think it's maybe not, I would just wish, I mean, maybe it's just more a wish that, that I feel if, that we can talk about all personal issues because at the end, no matter if it's physical or mental or anything, that there is no fear of, talking about the specific topic. I think that is, for me, at least what I see talking with about the topic, a lot of different people, that that's, it, there is a lot of fear, a lot of scariness. Am I allowed to talk about that? Should I talk about that? And I would just wish that we get less of that, that we have a culture that we can talk about anything that keeps us thinking during the night or during the days or makes it hard, harder to work, that we can talk about these things. It's not exactly an answer to your question. It's more like a, a wish that I would see in the future going to happen. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. Unfortunately, we're out of time now for the Q&A. So um, 
Thank you, everyone, for, for coming. Uh, we do have one quick announcement. Thank you, Michael, so much for, for your keynote. It was fantastic. <laughs> Sorry, just getting my notes here. Um, so coffee is in the exhibit hall. Session start at 11. And uh, Dan, Evelyn, uh, please check in at the registration. There's a lost item for you. Uh, <laughs> Evelyn, Evelyn, pardon me. Oh, sorry, 1045. I, I read my notes wrong. Pardon me. Session started at 1045. And I guess that's it. So thank you again, Michael, and thank you, everyone. Uh, have a great day.